having some new faces to see on these game drives. I'm sure it is. But well, good morning. I know it's been a bit of a late start with the with the with the sunrise bushwalk this morning. But we are here and we are on and we're going to try our best to try and make it to the end of the show. I'm Stefan Winterboer. On camera today is Wim Dunbach. And we have been filming this morning early. We managed to film the sunrise this morning with some giraffe that we're crossing into this area. And I want to see if we can pick up this male giraffe again. He just moved off into the tree line. And it's going to be quite interesting to see what he's been doing. Giraffe generally don't enjoy places where there's too much undulation because obviously being as tall as what they are their center of gravity is very high and they fall over they don't always fall over and die instantly like some articles will have you believe giraffe can actually take a knock fall down and get up again pretty easy but it's when they fall down and hit their head that it becomes a bit of a problem that long neck that they have doesn't really have the muscle attachment that it needs to stabilize it in a whip-like motion and, uh, and quite often giraffe will fall hard and bang their head on the floor and that is when they do some damage to themselves. I haven't seen it that much. I think in all of my years here in the Kruger, I've probably seen giraffe die like that maybe two or three times. But in any case, I'm not after giraffe dead here. I just want to see where he's gone and walked into the bushes here. Come with. As you can see, it's actually been a, it's a pretty hazy morning this morning. There's a lot of moisture in the air. And how I'm going to show you this moisture now is if you have a look over the treetops towards the horizon, you'll notice that there's a slight grayishness in the, in the band of cloud or band of air that's just a little bit above the horizon there that VM is showing you now. It looks like cloud, but it isn't. It is in a way a cloud, I suppose. It's a, quite a dispersed cloud. We've had a lot of moisture in the air today um, and it's just one of those typically May days where you just have a lot of moisture in the air. The evenings are getting cooler and that means that water is, um, is condensing out of the atmosphere relatively easy at the moment. There is still a little bit of moisture in the air. That will disappear as we start going into June and July. And you can see here some remnants of that water, that mist, that condensation on the leaves surfaces. There's shiny little dots that you're having a look at over there. That's water droplets. And why I picked this terminalia is because terminalia's leaves have got some hair on them. And those hair make for excellent condensation points actually. And uh, almost is what gives this, uh, this, name, this tree its name. The terminalia sericea. And it means that it's a tree with terminal leaves at the end of a branch and as you can see at the end of all these branches are the terminal leaves and sericea meaning densely hairy <coughs> and I'll see if I can show you a densely hairy leaf here let me pick one of these leaves you can see some of those hairs over here now Justin has asked me a nice question Justin has asked, you can see those hairs there, quite tough, velvety feel to it. Sorry, Justin. Justin, you asked me if, um, if there are any other edible plants in the bush. There are a lot of edible plants in the bush. Um, nothing really this time of the year. The last thing that became edible now, I think, was probably the guari bushes had their berries on. That was the last edible berry. The next time we're going to start seeing edible plants again will be from about September. Late September onwards, we will see we will start to see some more edible plants. There may be a few jackal berries around at the moment, and then of course the ever-present marula seed. So marulas they fruited in about February this year, and marulas would have dropped down. A lot of them would have dropped down. A lot of them would have been collected by squirrels. Their fruit eaten off by a variety of animals, and then it's left with this hard husk. Uh, a, a a kernel, a pip, and inside there are two to three seeds, which you can get this time of the year. Make a fantastic sort of bush food. You bash open the, 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 the nut, or you flip open a cap, and inside is a seed that you can eat out. Other bush tucker around at the moment is probably, the easiest to come by is of course termites. A lot of termites, harvested termites, and fungus growing termites are around at the moment. And they are doing their thing, collecting all the 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 the, 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 the dry grass and the bits and pieces of wood that they can get, taking it down into their nest. And quite often in the early morning you have 
these termites returning to their nests from foraging activities. They're easy to collect. One or two big grasshoppers around um, come down to plant and find the most interesting things. Right here is a grasshopper. Now it doesn't look like much, but there is one there. It's a grass-like grasshopper. And I literally just bent down to look underneath this little stump. And there we've got... Have a look at that. Isn't that the most extraordinary thing you've ever seen in your life? Obviously, trying its best to stay hidden. Now most insect predators hunt by sight. And their sight is triggered by movement. And so the best defense that a lot of these types of insects can have is to stay hidden and to stay absolutely still. And here we have a grasshopper whose obviously his best mechanism is to stay looking like a grass and absolutely still. Now what's interesting as well is on the same plant I'm able to show you the difference between a grasshopper which is primarily a daytime animal that's active in the day and stays hidden at night and a cricket Crickets are active at night and stay hidden in the day. And I'm going to ask Viam to come out a little bit so that I can show you this cricket. And here on the top of this leaf is a cricket. And you tell me what is immediately apparent, the difference between the cricket and the grasshopper. This is a cricket. I'm going to tell you now, those antennae are the dead giveaway. Have a look at how long those antennae are. That is how I know that this is a cricket. They've quite often got these very long antennae. They've also got a slightly different body structure. Slightly fatter, slightly different head. You're seeing my caffeine shake translated into the leaf at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, Vim. <laughs> All right. And I think while we move on from this particular bush and go and have a look at another bush with whatever wonders it's got and I'm sure Joffers is waiting to give you an update. And here we are again, Joff is back online. So we've had some exciting news. There's, there was a leopard found by one of the Cheetah Plains uh, rangers. Um, unfortunately, it was not a very thick, dense area. So right now, we, we're currently on our way there. Um, and we're going to see if we can possibly relocate. And not 100% sure, but they did say it was a female. So maybe this is going to be my first opportunity to see uh, the well-known world renowned Karula. Let's see what's there. I hear you had a beautiful little grasshopper with, with Steph. Always little little creatures that are interesting, you know, and I've I've always thought about how it's the the smaller aspects of the bush that make up the bigger picture. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's so awesome to, to have a walk and a drive. You know, the drive, you, you've seen the big game, you've seen a lot more area. But the walk, you can see the smaller details and you can see what everything is all about. And at home, you're really getting the big picture of what does the bush have to offer. You know, this, this is Africa. This is, this is home for, for most of us. Um, and uh, this is definitely home for me. James Richard, you're asking, do I prefer game drives or walks? I'll say I, I prefer walking. Um, but I love game drives as well. You know, I love, I love to do a game drive to see the different areas, cover more ground, um, you know, and also get nice and, and close to animals. Um, the, the walking is something that I've always been passionate about. 
you know, growing up on, on the game reserve in, in Zimbabwe or Rhodesia at that time, it, it was something it was something unique um, and something very very special. Where, when you walk in, you don't realise it, but all of your your senses get going. You now listening to the bush, what's around you. You listening to the birds calling, to the lions roar. You know, you're listening to all of the aspects. Then you're smelling everything. Um, like those elephant droppings I just picked up, I've still got a scent on my hands. Uh, you know, those are actually quite fresh. <laughs> um, but all of these senses really get working. Your your, your smell, your hearing, your sight. Um, you, you're looking at different aspects of the bush when you walk in. You're seeing tracks that you'll never see when you're driving. You're seeing things like the grasshopper Steph just showed you. That is a little bit more difficult to see from a vehicle. Um, and yeah, some of my best experiences that I've had in the bush have been on, on foot. Um, you know, one place that I really, really love and it's really taken a piece of my heart is Mashatu in Botswana where I used to do walking trails. Um, you know, that, that's something very special and really close to my heart. But check what we've got up here. We have got a very old buffalo bull. And by the way, that store was on purpose you know I just wanted to make sure you didn't have the sound of the vehicle so right now we let him come closer to us good old trusty landy so you see the reason why I say that this is an old buffalo you're gonna see him in the beautiful light here um, now, if you look at his horns, they're very smoothened out. And buffalo tend to do this when, when they get these little cavities. And as they get these cavities in the horns, they go to trees and they rub their horns up against the tree um, to fill these little holes. And this is like a cork filling a wine bottle. Same concept. It's just pieces of soft bark that are going into the horn and preventing parasites from getting in there. And you can also see, you know, this, this big boy, uh, he's had a, a fair amount of, of argument with other male buffaloes, um, missing that left part of that horn there. Shame, he's a, he's a very big boy, this, but, you know, he's also old. Um, and it's actually quite interesting, in the, in the local language, we refer to buffalo bulls like this as dugger boys. Now... It's called a dugger boy because of their habits. Um, dugger in the local language, it means mud. So essentially what we call them is a mud boy. And this is because of their, their habits, um, you know, more so in summer. When they, when they get very hot, they go into a mud wallow. And they will, they'll stay in this mud wallow for the day. First of all, they're caking that mud against them. Like you can see on this, on this big uh, dugger boy, if you look towards his bum, you can see the little marks where he's been wallowing and that, that mud has stuck to him. Now when that mud sticks to him, so I'm just going to go back a second so you can keep a visual of him. Um, when, when he goes into that mud, all of the external parasites will stick onto that body. Okay? And... As they stick to the body, they stick to, to the mud once it's caked against them, like, like Brian has just showed you on the bun. Um, and then they go to a tree, okay, and they, they scratch, and they scratch, scratch, scratch against the tree, and while they're scratching, they're exfoliating their skin. So by exfoliating their skin, they're getting rid of parasites, number one. But a way to tell that it's an old buffalo as well, is often you'll find they lose the hair around the rump. All right, and this is due to that continuous rubbing over the, over the years. Um, a lot of those hairs get removed. But just because it comes off a buffalo, it doesn't mean that that hair goes to waste. This now opens up a whole new opportunity for birds to use that, that hair in their nests. Yeah, use it to cushion their nest, use it to keep it incubated. So again, going back to the smaller aspects of the bush, you know, the bush keeps going. It's all working in one big circle which is, you know, quite phenomenal if you actually think about it. Um, so, you know, that's where they get the name the Dugger Boy from. The local language, the Mud Boy. 
it's getting warmer. As it gets warmer, the animals will get more active for a period of time until the heat of the day. From there, they go down, they rest, just like a human. It gets too hot, what do you do? You go inside, you have a nice cold glass of water and in, a, in, a, in a room with an AC and you cool off. Same like the animals, you know, you're right in front of us. This is a, an AC for, this is an AC for the, um, for the animals. You know, sit in the shade, have your cold glass of water in the morning when the water's still nice and fresh and later afternoon and have a relaxing day. But on that note, we're going to go over to Steph with the bushwalk. And uh, he sounds like he's got some pretty interesting things going on there. And we will catch up shortly. We're going to make our way towards the area where the leopard was sighted. And we will try our luck and see if we can relocate. See you later. I must be honest with you, we've come through this very, very sticky patch. This is a thicket that's filled with black monkey thorn and it's filled with, with, uh, with buffalo thorn. And these are the hookiest, stickiest plants that we have out here. You can see what VM's showing you over there, that hooked, spiked stick of the buffalo thorn that he's got inside there. This, in Afrikaans, is quite often lovingly referred to as the huck and stick bush. And the reason why they say that is the hook and stick bush is because you get caught up in these guys very, very easily. I'm going to see if I can sacrifice a little bit of my uniform to that. You can see how he's hooking and have a look there. Now what happens is you try and get in and it sticks you and then you go out and then back. And now I'm stuck properly in this bush as you can see. Now what you have to do is carefully get yourself out of there and the trick is not to let the branch go too early because the whippiness causes the hook thorn to hook into your finger and they're, oh, they're hidden by this leaf you can see there. A vicious plant this, I must be honest with you. But one of the better plants out here and the reason why it has such vicious thorns is because the leaves are incredibly tasty for almost everything. Almost every browser eats the leaves of this particular tree. This huck and stick bush or the buffalo thorn. Another one is this black monkey or a uh, black monkey thorn that we have here. This is a type of acacia and these now just have hook thorns. Now they've got the smaller hook thorns on their leaves you can see there but by far the most vicious of them all are the ones on the stem. Have a look at these guys here. Like a fang of something to be quite honest. That thing is so sharp, it's going into my finger, even as, even as I'm just touching it. Now they're grabby, these bushes are grabby. I'm very careful when we walk through these particular areas. Now Carol has just asked me if I ever had to spend some time in the bush. Carol, yes, I have actually spent a lot of time in the bush, but I'm going to go into that in a second. I just want to show you this weevil. I've been noticing a lot of these guys lately. This is on a Peltiforum bush, totally different to the two trees that we we're just having a look at and that this doesn't have any thorns on whatsoever in actual fact it's got the softest most velvety leaves that you've ever felt before in your life and li literally recently and by recently I'm talking about this week these trees have become infested with this type of bug now I know it's a bug because it doesn't have any discernible mouth parts the mouth parts of bugs or hemiptera is, is the insect order that they belong to. Hemiptera are designed specifically for piercing and sucking. And this particular bug is obviously sucking the juices out of this peltiforum of this African weeping wattle. And I know it's a bug because as you can see from quite close there, can you see him, Viam? Not really. No. Can you see? I think you've got the camera pointed. See this white Dot here. See where my. Hold on one second. It's so small. We're battling to find it for you. Don't worry. We'll get it right now. Okay. Have a look there. There he goes. Now, I don't have a clue what this particular bug is, 
But I know it's a bug because he's got no mouth parts that we can see. I'm going to try and turn him a little bit sideways. There you can see nothing on his head. Just sucking and piercing is what these guys do. A very, very diverse order of, of insect, this Hemiptera. Quite slow moving, very bizarrely shaped animals. To be honest, this one's covered in this dense white fur. Can't see any eyes. Not a weevil. And not an assassin bug. Although, no. So he's just a bug. Let's have a look how bizarre that is. Why are they so furry? Who alone only knows? Fur in the, in the insect world gets used for insulation. So to help them help keep animals warm or cold. It's also used as a deterrent for bats in moths for instance. They are densely furry to absorb bats echolocation uh, noises. In this particular instance what why this particular bug would be hairy I have no idea. I think it's probably for some thermoregulation for some either to stay warm or to stay cold and allow this animal to operate at levels that are potentially or at times of days that are potentially less active for other bugs and so he reduces competition that way. That would be what my brain is telling me at the moment. Now back to Carol's question. Carol, I have spent lots of time uh, out in the wilderness. I'm a wilderness trails guide and part of what I specialize in and what I love doing is sleeping out in the bush. And to be honest, the rougher the better. The rougher it is in the bush, the better for me. I love going into places that are inaccessible to vehicles, inaccessible to most people and then setting up camp and doing exploration walks from there or just moving through areas like that. In total probably I've spent, wow, maybe 10 months worth, 12 months worth of time sleeping in the Kruger National Park just in a sleeping bag or in a hammock or in a tent that you carry on your back. Relatively easy. So I hope that answered your question, Carol. No, I haven't been eaten just yet. <coughs> I still retain the function of most of my limbs. Contrary to popular belief, it's not that dangerous to actually walk and sleep out in the bush if you have the proper knowledge and you take the proper precautions, that is. A lot of buffalo tracks. Now James, while, while, we busy, while I'm busy looking through all of this vegetation, James Richards has asked quite a nice question. What is the oldest tree species that grows in this area? James, the oldest tree species that is in this area is probably a leadwood. I would say that leadwoods probably grow the longest. But the oldest tree species in South Africa is one of the olives. There's, a, there's an olive dated at about 4,100, 4,200 years old. Um, and they are just slightly older than the baobab trees. You do get baobab trees in, in South Africa as well. Not in this particular area where we are now, but definitely in the Kruger Park, a little bit further north of where we are. Literally not even much, a couple of hundred kilometers, maybe 100 kilometers, 60 miles or so north of where we are. And they, ha they grow to astronomical ages as well, three and a half thousand years, four thousand years old trees. I just think it's, it's phenomenal. But here in this particular area in the Sabi Sands, I would have to say that it's probably the leadwood. They grow the biggest and they're the hardest woods and they stand the longest as well. We're looking at about 600 years to about 1,200 years for a, bay for a leadwood tree, Combritum imberbi. On that note, and another hardwood of the bush. Old uh, Joffers is waiting to give you an update on whatever he's found. Okay, so while, while we've been apart for that short while, we came, came across some leopard tracks, something very exciting. So we've got these leopard tracks and they're heading along this road. I can't see them right now on the side of the vehicle, but you know what? I think I've got the idea that we're going to carry on on this road because what leopards tend to do, they will go off the road, they'll walk through the bush to take shortcuts. Now you can see how the road is starting to, starting to bend around here. So as the road bends around, a leopard's not going to waste its time. It can just cut straight through on the game path like we chatted about earlier with the hippo. Fantastic. It's going to join back up on the road somewhere. 
So as we go in, let's all keep a watchful eye, see if we can see anything. Please, for you back home, if you think that you've seen something on the road or seen something on camera, let's work together as a team here. Let's find this leopard together. So the leopard that got called in um, earlier this morning from Chris, one of the one of the other guides, is he called it in a female. And what's quite interesting here, it looks like we've actually got tracks of a male leopard. So this could actually be two potential leopards in one area. Um, and now we're on a mission to find out what exactly is going on here, who is where, and what are they up to. You know, this is where the tracking gets really exciting now trying to establish who's who and who's where and that's a fantastic thing about tracking in the bush we've got the road out in the cities in the concrete jungles you've got the newspaper it tells you who's done gone where who's done what during the night so you know for us in the bush what you're looking at in front of us is our newspaper so right now what we are doing we are reading it all together and I've got the uh, trusty help of, of two chuckers on the back uh, Chuck O'Brien and Chuck and Jamie so we're all working together as a team as well as you back home and we're going to see what we can find Joey from Australia, good morning. You are asking, what is one animal that I've never seen that I would really like to see? I'd say it's more a bird. Um, and this bird is called a Narina trogan. It is one of the most spectacular birds that you find. It has a beautiful coloration. And you know what, I'm actually going to stop here for a second because I want to show you a picture of this. So one thing I always make sure is I've always got my, my whole bag of tricks with me. So I'm going to go into my bag of tricks, I'm going to grab my bird book and we're going to have a look at this Narina Trogan. Um, and you know, the, the part of the reason why I haven't seen one yet is we don't get them in the area where I currently operate or operated in the Kruger National Park. Um, so, James, you don't mind, I'm actually going to ask you to, to find it while, while we have a chat here. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly rare one to see. There has been a few recorded sightings in the Kruger National Park of them. But they do tend to hang around a more denser, foresty type area. One of the areas that we do have out here is, thank you, Jamie, is um, a, a, an area called the Blyder River Canyon. And in the Blyder River Canyon, this is tends to be the best possibility of finding them. I've been there twice and I'm yet to find one. But they cannot be elusive forever. I go back into my bag of goodies with this little pair of binoculars. This is my lucky pair of binoculars, just by the way. One day these will find that Narina Trogan for me. And one day I'm going to photograph that Narina Trogan and one day you will see that photograph of a Narina Trogan. So, Look how beautiful that is. Look at, look at the colors. And when it flies, I've heard incredible things about it. It has apparently the most stunning iridescent coloration that comes through out on the back here. And very prominent one that you can, you know, immediately identify it is that very red chest and the very yellow beak. Another very distinguishing feature about them is that eye. So you can see the male, he's got a lot of blue around the face. So that's another way that you can identify him. Um, and it's actually a very nice example here of the bird species that we find here. If you look at the female, look at her chest compared to the male. Even look at her, you know, the different colorations on the back, on the wings as well. So out here, um, the... The males are always the prettier ones, you know, and this is because, you know, we have to impress the ladies. Um, same as the bird species. <laughs> Some of these birds have an exceptionally tough time. 
there's some birds like part of the roller family they literally have to go up and um, go up and do the go up and do the, the displays where they're part of the roller family because they fly really high up and they start to perform acrobatics and they have to have this beautiful iridescent coloration um, same with the Narina Trogan, you know, that, that, that color is what really draws in that female and that is all part of their courtship behavior to, to, get, uh, to get the mating rights. But right now while we carry on for looking for this leopard, we're going to go over to Steph. And myself and Viam actually came to this, this tattoo bush which I'm going to tell you about in a bit and Viam remarked um, that there was this scorpion hole here that looked like it had been made by a lobster it's so big what we're going to try and do is actually fish the scorpion out this is a species of burrowing scorpion and they are fastidious about keeping their burrows clean what i'm hoping that we get to see is him try and clean this piece of grass there he comes there he comes shh, shh, shh. i'm going to see if he comes out and he wants to clean this piece of grass out of his come on boy it's one of the easiest ways to get them out is to dirty their burrows they don't like they don't like the dirt and he's got hold of this piece of grass but now to try and fish him out into the light I think we've lost him for today but these burrows can go 45 centimeters, you know, a lot of inches into the ground. And it's quite safe to use a piece of grass like this. I'll show you now the end of the grass. Let's give him a few seconds to calm down and come out. The end of the grass is feathered, as you see over there. So I can't hurt him by putting the piece of grass. If I were to use the other side of the grass, this side, Sometimes the grass is quite sharp and you could actually stab into the abdomen Which is why I never use the sharp side of the grass. I always use the feathered side of the grass or the inflorescence And it's very safe to fish them out of the holes like it's like I said all we're doing is we're dirtying we're dirtying the uh, The hole and then he comes and grabs it and says well, oh, I don't want this in and he comes and pushes it out of the hole Let's give him a couple of minutes and while we're looking at while we're giving him a couple of minutes to come back to his entrance I want to show you this interesting plant it grows here on the side of these banks in the drainage lines here and is a indigenous type of plumbago this is plumbago zelanica and not only is it a very tasty treat for lots of butterflies and moths but it's used very heavily locally in medicine this is an abortive making decoctions of this or making a tea from this will actually cause uh, an abortion which is not a, a nice thing to do but in any case it's one of those things but what i like about this particular plant is that it gets its name the tattoo plant because of a characteristic of its root if you take the root of this particular plant and you skin it and you lay it on your skin and you wrap up those bark touching the skin for 24 hours when you take the root off after 24 hours your skin is blistered and will be blistered in the patterns that you've laid the root out and then the blisters obviously heal and what happens then is the scar tissue underneath those blisters is discolored it will be a different color to your skin and they used to use intricate patterns whirls and lines and angles on your skin on your back on your chest um, most Africans are not hairy at all and tattoos like this stick out on their skin and makes them look quite pretty decorative tattoos now while I'm speaking to you the hair on the back of my neck is raising we've had ox pickers screaming at us and they slipped under there there goes another one so they've just slipped into their nest and they'd be obviously feeding some chicks inside there now feeding the chicks pieces of scab and wound from animals as well as ticks those particular types of ox pickers they actually feed on blood mostly they sit on the animals you've seen them on buffalo all the time i'm sure with the, with james or with jamie or with brent and this is where they nest in a tree and it's nice to know because we all come back here quite often we'll keep an eye out some new additions to their family 
I think what we've done is given the scorpion some decent time to relax. Let's see if we can get him out now. So I'm sticking in the grass again. This is called scorpion fishing, by the way. Now, quite often they will sit at the entrance to their burrows. Let's see. No. He's gotten wind of us. They're very sensitive to vibrations. And I think what he's done is he's felt us moving around over here and he's gone and retreated down into the depths of his hole to come out later tonight to hunt whatever's walking around the entrance of his hole. But on that note, Joffers has got an update for you. And then Tom. Okay, there you are. Now, I was just going to act like a leopard. I know we haven't seen one yet, but thought I'd throw in some humor. But <laughs> I'm really not a serious person, don't worry. Um, you know, something, something very important about the bush is, you know, traditional beliefs and medicinal purposes and, and that sort. Um, and like we said, how, how the food sources are, are slowly starting to disappear as we get further into, into the different seasons, as we get further into winter. Um, you, you may remember James stopped yesterday morning at, at this tree. Um, and this is the Zizifus macronata. Uh, the, and the, the local name for it is a buffalo thorn. And now this is the one that James said to us, if you're ever angry in the bushes, come and look at one of these. And he just said, uh, Zizifus. And apparently that, that's a therapeutic way of doing it. Um, anyways, this, this tree is something quite unique. And these little, little leaves can be a lifesaver to you in the bush. What you do is you just take a whole lot of them together and you put them in some hot water and you can make a local spinach. You can make a wild bush spinach, which is something pretty awesome to do. So you literally just take it and you eat it, hoping that no leopard is marked on it, obviously. Um, this one still seems to be all right. So the reason why I actually want to show this to you is because there's a very strong traditional belief for one of the cultures in South Africa called the Zulu culture. Now, what they believe with one of these trees is if somebody in your family dies, you have to collect their soul and you have to lay it to rest at their original place where they were born. So what you do, you come to this buffalo thorn and you break off a branch. Now, let's say I have a relative and I'm part of the Zulu culture, for, for example, and somebody has unfortunately passed away i would grab a branch of this and just sweep it over where that individual had passed and while i'm doing this i'm picking up the soul and the soul is being captured in the branches now what i'll do then is take that soul to where that person was born but along the way you have to treat this as an individual if you buy a bus ticket you buy two bus tickets if you buy a meal, you buy two meals. It is very, very important that this happens. Um, and that's eventually how you get to the point of laying that soul back to rest. And, you know, another sense of this is the locals believe that if there's an electric storm out and about, and you happen to be stuck in this electrical storm, um, you don't want to get struck by lightning. So one of the techniques you can use is you come to this tree, and if you look at the, the, the nature of the branch here, Brian, I'm sure you'll be able to get through here, and you can see that zigzag effect. And to me, that directly reminds me of a lightning bolt, and for the locals as well. So if you're not on this electric storm, you don't want to be struck by lightning, you come and you simply sit under one of these, and it's said that you will then be protected from it. Um, you know, that's one of the really unique ones about it, uh, as well as uh, the whole story with the Zulu. Um, but where it actually gets the name from the locals, the buffalo thorn, is it is said that when a buffalo has been hunted by lions, it comes into here, into a little cavity area like this, and the buffalo sticks his bum in here. So his whole back is protected because no predator in their right mind is going to try to get through this. Um, 
So he sticks his bum into it and he throws his horns <laughs> in a figure of eight. So nothing can come at him from the front. He's protected. Nothing can come at him from the back. Eventually the predator gets so bored, off they go. They say, we've had enough of this nonsense. We're going to go look for something else. And happy days for the buffalo. He stands up and he can carry on, walk off, carry on with his daily basic duties. Um, so, you know, there's something, something very unique. One of the more unique trees that we do have out here. This is one of my favorite trees that we have just because of all the stories that it holds. Um, and the reason why I say that, you know, lions, they don't enjoy this is there's two types of thorns in here. Okay. So I just don't want to prick myself here. It does tend to be a little bit, little bit painful. Um, but if you, if you look at the side here, you can see a thorn pointing, pointing straight out. And then you can see one hooking back. See that there? All right. So in Afrikaans, we call this a vach abiki boss. Means wait a bit bush. Because if I had to walk through here, you've got horns holding you back, but also thorns coming from the front. So you literally, you stand there and you wait for someone to come along uh, with a pocket knife so they can start to trim the branches and, and get you out of that situation. And I've been in it. It is not very comfortable. And I don't really wish that upon anyone. Um, but it, it, it's a beautiful tree. It's got beautiful colors. And it's, it's something unique. You know, something that I really enjoy out here. And definitely one of my favorite aspects of the bush. But we're still in the area of the leopard tracks. So we're going to carry on. We're going to see if we can find these leopard tracks. And along with your help, we're going to see if we can spot it. All right, let's get going. Okay. And we're up and running again. I feel like I'm doing a gym session every time I get in. Okay. Nothing like the sound of uh, your vehicle starting in the in the bush. Okay. While we carry on looking for this leopard, let's catch up with Steph and see what he's up to. Now, on the, on the theme of bush food, this particular plant is a jackalberry. And jackalberries not only have berries that we can eat, but they also are the host for a larvae, a big hairy worm like this called a mupani worm. And mupani worms in this particular area love to eat jackalberries. And I know because we've had some late season rains, some of these jackalberries are actually host to these worms. And they are seen as a delicacy here in South Africa. They're eaten raw, they squeezed out, they freeze dried, they turned into a powder, they, they are cooked over open coals, cooked in oil. The, the amount of different recipes that you can get from a Mupani worm is astounding. You're welcome to go and have a look where you're sitting at the moment. They're not the most appetizing looking worms, I must be honest with you. It's M-O-P-A-N-E worm. Go and have a look there and see what I'm busy looking for. Giant worm. And I, this particular jackalberry doesn't look like it actually has any caterpillars eating on it now. But, you know, it always helps to have a decent look inside one of these things. To see if you can see. Now I'm getting spider webs all over my face. I don't see any to be honest. Might just be a little bit too late to them. Ah, but what we do have. Moth, yeah. yeah, this is we've been seeing this moth around. In actual fact, VM, if you come around this side, sorry, this is one of these moths that's got two faces. He's got a face on the front of his body, right? The one that's looking at the right hand side of your screen now. And then there's a face at the back of his body, a pseudo face. He's busy rubbing his wings together there to make it look like his head. Ah, there he's opening up. Have a look at how pretty that is. Wow. Good. How revealing is that? He went from this camouflaged animal with two heads 
to this unbelievably mauvey, beautiful blue color. I have no idea what butterfly this is. That's Brent's domain. What I can tell you though is that the, he's orientated himself perpendicular to the sun. And that's so that the fluid in his wings can warm up. So butterflies have those big wide wings. It heats up the fluid. Fluid goes into their body warm, like a big radiator. And they then get active in the middle of the day. It's the time of the butterflies is the middle of the day. It's, it's when it's hottest you have the most butterflies out. And that's because they can really operate in that range. Their wings are fantastic radiators. Keeps them cool, warms them up. Um, and on top of all of that, they also look good. And so obviously, it's a natural place to put your most colors, your most colors on and the scales on a butterfly's wings. Oh, there we go. So you obviously had warmed up enough to fly away. I want to show you something else. Vim, come stand this side, sorry. We had a look at this little grasshopper a little bit earlier and I think that this particular grasshopper is actually making himself look like a piece of bird dropping. Now, we were mulling over the reason why and I think that this particular grasshopper looks like a bird dropping simply because if you are, if you are the prey species, if you are going to be dinner for a bird, the best way to hide from a bird is to look like it's droppings. And I think that that is exactly what this little grasshopper has tried to do. It's tried to mimic a bird's dropping. And in so doing is left alone by the birds. Quite nice, eh? Hey? Isn't it interesting? Almost every single tree that we walk up to has got something going on. Absolutely. And we'll carry on exploring this wonderful little drainage line. And rather than have a look at my shiny bald head disappear into the thicket in the front there, Joffers has probably got something very interesting to tell you. Okay, and here we are now again. We've just come past a, a riverbed. You know, when we're looking for our, our leopards, a fantastic place to look is these riverbeds. They do tend to hang around in them because the vegetation does tend to be a little bit thicker. So, if you look at a leopard, how it is built, it is built for stealth and strength. So, when they're in the riverbed, they are in their prime hunting zone. They can give a 23 second or 23 meters per second burst and they can really quickly jump onto something. So we came into this riverbed um, to check what was, what was happening, see if we could find any sign of the leopards. And we bumped into a, a little bit of a grumpy bull elephant. Um, he seems to have woken up on the wrong side of the termite mound this morning. Um, so we, we're going to give him a little bit of space, you know, we don't want to disturb them. We want them to be as comfortable with us as we are with them. So rather, we're going to carry on. We're going to continue looking for our leopards and we'll make a loop around and see if we can find any further sign. Okay, and you won't believe it. Up ahead, we've got a laser spotted African vehicle. Uh, just a transfer vehicle. <laughs> Justin, you've got a question of what does South Africa have to offer that nowhere else in the world does. Um, Justin, I'd say it's it's one of the most unique areas for for game viewing experiences. Um, you know, when you when you come to an area like this, there's so much diversity around. You know, there's always something different to look at, always different animal behaviors everywhere you go throughout this country. Um, and it, it's something beautiful, I mean, it's something that you, you'll find different adventures in different countries, like New Zealand, I mean, the land of adventure, Africa, you know, the continent of safari, and more specifically, South Africa. You know, and that's why 
you know, I, I particularly love South Africa. I've guided in Botswana and it was fantastic and I, I absolutely loved it. But you know what they say, how they say that there is really no place like home. Um, and I really do feel at home in the South African bush, you know, around the Kruger National Park where it is and the Sabi Sands where it's just undisturbed and, you know, it's, it's something very special and hold it close to my heart. Ah, there's a cat. Cat. Not a real cat, not an animal cat, but it's a cat bulldozer. <laughs> um, well, what they're doing there is they're just building a, a dam, extending a dam. As we head into winter, you know, we, we are going to need the water sources out and about. So this is just plans that we put forward to, to help, help the uh, animals out. Oh, look at that. It's a, it's a whole pride of them. <laughs> Big ones, small ones. Oh, fantastic, man. The morning's heating up. Okay. So I hear that um, you're, you're looking for some Mapani worms this morning with Steph. And, you know, I, I must say, there's nothing like a good crunchy uh, Mapani worm. Um, you know, for, for the birds, they, they absolutely love it. Um, sometimes I love it too. <laughs> um, no, just jokes. But for, for the birds, you know, it's a great nutritional food source for them. And, you know, it's something that they'll often go after uh, during the tough times in the bush. And, you know, we have had a, a fairly dry year. Last year we didn't receive our regular annual rainfall. So a lot of the, a lot of the parts of the bush are starting to deteriorate a lot quicker than normal this year. Um, so that's why we're finding the animals taking different different roles and, and feeding on different parts of the bush. Something like a buffalo that is regularly uh, a grazer, you know, I've now noticed how the buffaloes are starting to become browsers and they're starting to feed on the leaves. Because remember, your grazer feeds primarily on grasses, your browser feeds on the leaves. So your buffalo is going from a grazer to start browsing or to keep those nutrients going. But why I've stopped here on that note, um, you know, to keep the body supplemented, is we've got something on the right here that you you see all all over the bush. Now, this here, this is a a bone. Um, yeah, there's not much left of it, so I can't tell you exactly what it was. Um, but talking about supplementing. The diets of these animals. If you look at the top here, you can see how it's been gnawed and it's been chewed on. Just on, on the top there. Okay, and the animals out here, they have to practice something very specific called osteophagia. Now what osteophagia is, it's a practicing of eating bones to get the calcium the body requires. So a lot of the time, they can't get it from this vegetation that they feed on. They've got to look at other ways to supplement the diet. Now what you may have seen back at home, you may have seen your dogs, where they go and they lick the soil. They often do it in areas of, that are very red in soil, because it's very high in iron content. So that's how they get the iron. The animals out here do it, buffaloes I've seen do it many a time. Um, and even the bones, buffaloes will suck on a bone. Impalas, giraffe. So sometimes you can have good fun with that. Um, so... Let's get you a little bit closer here and just show you exactly where, where these animals are eaten and you can actually see how there's been a, a chip taken out of there. And you see that there. And you know, this is this is fantastic for them. But at the same time, it's not just the hyenas that do the cleaning up. They clean up the bones after a carcass. This goes a lot deeper. So now let's say I'm I'm an impala. I come here, I pick up this bone, and I take it, and, you know, I get the calcium my body needs, and I carry on walking, and then I drop it. Okay, what's just happened there? The bones, they've been dispersed. So what's happening is a dispersal of the bones is eventually going to disintegrate, and that calcium will go back into the soil that is left. So by that calcium going into the soil, 
your calcium rich soil which at the end of the day you get fantastic greenery coming through and again it goes back to the whole circle of life and how the bush goes around in one big one big circle so it is something very important out here it's something very special very unique and it's these smaller aspects like we said just now that make up the bigger picture and um, you know something like of this size something like this most likely it was bitten in half by a hyena um, and out here we refer to our, our hyena as a spotted hyena um, it's it's the the one that we find in this region um, so literally he will come taken his jaw whack uh, got in through it get into got to nice bone marrow perfect and that sort of comes out as and that opens up a, a, a dietary supplement for the rest of the animals so it is something important and something that we will see quite a bit out here but like you can see this is a perfect example because there's no other bones all right this is a barren area there's no other bones the carcass was not originally here if it was, we would most likely see a head, the horns, you know, and a bit more signs, sometimes the hooves and that sort. Okay. But, let's carry on. Let's see what else we can find. The morning is starting to, to heat up quite nicely. Um, so we're gonna, gonna keep moving. But something very important here. You can see where I picked up this bone from and the way that it was placed. It's very important that when we do return something to where we picked it up, that we put it back in exactly the same spot. Just by going, just like that, back here, home he goes. And the reason why I say that this is so important is an animal could be starting off a home underneath that bone. And we don't want anybody to ruin this. We don't want people to come into our home and ruin our homes exactly the same as the animals don't want anybody to come in and ruin their homes. So it's something important. You know, at the end of the day, we need to respect the bush, and the bush respects us. So it works both ways. And that, you know, at the end of the day, we get rewarded with fantastic sightings. Everyone's happy, and everyone goes home happy. But let's carry on. Let's see what else is out there. Okay. So one second, just going to pop my earpiece back on so I can get your questions. And we aim for away, so ask away. Okay. So you can hear now as you've been going how the bird activity has slowly started to to drop off and slowly started to uh, get get quiet and um, but what we're going to do now as we carry on we'll link back to Steph the only way that we got to see this particular amazing animal was because he was crossing this tiny open patch of sand that you can see him on. But can you believe that this is a praying mantis, a grass-like praying mantis and his obvious hunting grounds are dead sticks and dead branches and he must be having the absolute best time at the moment. Now as I mentioned insects hunt by movement. This particular little insect predator would be looking for movement and would react very well to movement. Those enormous eyes that he has on top of his head. <coughs> he has his head. Whoa! <laughs> there he goes. Okay, let me see if we can get him. It's going to be a bit tough to find frame again, so just give us a little bit of patience. But basically, underneath the grass is where he is sitting at the moment. Trying his best to look like a stick and doing a very, very good job at it. Those enormous eyes would be very, very, very susceptible to movement. Oh, there he goes again. There he is here, Vim. There we go. Isn't that just the most amazing thing? So, praying mantis hunt by stealth. 
they will then react to movement, shoot out those forearms, and with those quite long forearms, in actual fact, scoop up the prey. Right at these forearms, these are curved inwards. This is a double forearm. It actually flaps open and forms a hook with quite nasty spines on it, to be quite honest. And he'll immobilize the prey. There are actually two arms here. It's not just one. He's just holding them together to look more like a stick. Two arms here, holding the prey, bring up to the mouth, and quite often just decapitated. Have a look at how he's watching this grass here. Oh, isn't it just amazing? Long legs for getting through the grass and the undergrowth. Very actively just watching us and watching and seeing that we're not going to step on him, which of course I'm going to try not to do. And then I think we can leave him alone. He's given us. He's going to go into the grass there and away. Amazing, eh? I just love these things, to be honest. For me, there's nothing better than looking at one of these little guys hunting. I had the pleasure the other day of watching one of these, or a similar grasshopper, <coughs> I mean, uh, praying mantis, hunt a spider. And, uh, and the spider, basically, the praying mantis came from behind the spider. And the spider was walking, praying mantis saw him. Praying mantis saw the spider walking. Praying mantis came, had a look at the spider, and then waited for the spider to walk past. And then came from the back and grabbed the spider, but from an angle at the back that was only possible because that praying mantis knew that the spider had most of its eyes on the front of its body. Came from the back, grabbed the spider, grabbed it just behind the head and grabbed its legs to stop it from getting away and then just bit into it and basically killed the spider that way. Fascinating. And James Richards, I agree with you. I think praying mantises are one of the most fantastic predators that we have here. And I also haven't been, I haven't been able to contain myself. I've just been looking for them all the time this morning. So I'm glad you also enjoyed that. I did indeed. All right, now carry on with our search here. We are, as you can see, in a more open area where we're standing right now. <clears throat> a lot of dead grass around, you know. It's been, it's, it's, it's jarring, let me say, to put it to the least. It's quite jarring to see how little grass there actually is. You've got this tufts of grass. In actual fact, they're still relatively green. You can see that that is still green. Now that is what buffalo and what, oh, we've got a, not another got praying mantis here that's just jumped out of the grass. We'll go to him now. But you can see it's still green, relatively green. I mean, for a fairly sandy patch, it's actually quite incredible. But this will quickly be eaten by anything that comes past here. And, uh, and then there'll be not much left. I don't think we've got much. Huh? Um, we've got bets on how much grass is going to be left over by the end of summer. By the time October comes, usually this is what October looks like. It's going to be an interesting year. I hope you have been taking some screen grabs as we've been going through the season. You're in for a rare treat, an extra deep drought. And the pictures that you'll have now, compared to the pictures that you might get in two or three years' time, you won't believe the difference. So definitely keep an archive of that. And while we're at this, this is what jumped out of this grass. Have a look over here. It's another praying mantis. Now he has got his arms a different species of praying mantis and he's got his arms fully extended you can now see the hooks at the end of the at, at, the, at the claws and this would now swing under like that other praying mantis he now obviously keeps his arms extended for camouflage and you can see there's different there's different stripes on him he's also a different size he's quite big I'm going to put my finger next to him. There you go. Have a look. He's getting a bit nervous with my big pink finger next to him. They'll take it away and we'll just go back to using a grass as a pointer. Once again, typically praying mantis-like. Quite a robust thorax with a big head dominated by those two enormous eyes. And then the legs in the front. Here. There you go. You can see him. He closed his claspers. Or well, those highly modified front legs. Oh, VM, you must be getting some fantastic shots there, man. Now he's starting to sway in the wind, so his feelers can feel the wind. And that's actually a body movement. He's swaying in the wind. And that's to further just confuse prey. You can imagine being a little grasshopper that's half that size, and all of a sudden the branch that you're walking on 
grabs you with its spines and bites your head off. That's basically what what would happen, I think, if we were on a micro scale like these these guys hunt. They'd be terrifying to have around. Yeah, that thing claw. It's half the size of its arm. Yeah. Aqua has just made a lovely comment to say that there are species of praying mantis in North America that can catch hummingbirds. Aqua, that's phenomenal. Um, please absolutely send through a picture. I'd love to see that and we'd share it on, or share it on our Facebook page or send it via Twitter. <clears throat> if, if you can send pictures that way, I'm, I must say I'm a bit of a technophobe when it comes to that sort of thing. I don't know if you can send pictures. But email pictures to questions at wildearth.tv. Put it up on uh, on our Twitter handle, hashtag Safari Live. Put it up on our Facebook page. We'd love to see a praying mantis catching a hummingbird. This little guy probably won't be able to catch a hummingbird. He's about the size of my palm. I'll put it there in the background there. You'll be able to see my palm coming into, into focus there. But as VM quite rightly pointed out there, his claws, those front claws, are half the length of his body. So you can see now how he can extend it. And that, he's only two-thirds he's got a full another third of claw that can come out the top of that particular arm those appendages that he's sticking out there into the the sky he's trying his best to try and hide from us they can move incredibly incredibly quickly we're not posing any danger to him at all he's just he's got very good eyesight and that very good eyesight that he has is allowing him to see these two big nasty shapes. You can only imagine what he's going to go and talk about when he meets one of his friends. These two beings arrived out of nowhere, stared at him for a bit and then left again. And that's, I can try and conceptualize how they would basically perceive people. Blows my mind every time. But anyway, we're going to send you from where we are right now back to Joffers, who's going to carry on with his safari. Okay, so no, no luck with the leopard so far. So we're now on our way to Voyotelo Dam. Um, and from what I hear, you're in for a treat. Um, you know, it's, it's an area with some water around. So it should be fairly active um, and getting fairly active with animals like your buffaloes and elephants. Um, remember we spoke about that buffalo earlier and we said how they go into the mud during the heat of the day. Now, as the morning pro progresses, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten tremendously warmer very, very quickly. Um, Brian has even lost a few more layers again, um, which is always, always a positive sign. You know, he's, that's how you know the, the bush is getting, getting slightly warmer. So now as we head to Voyotelo Dam, we're going to be looking for signs of, of these leopards and as well as buffalo and elephant. Um, so we're definitely in for a treat. Let's see what we can find there. Yeah. As we as we're on our way here, you can already see there's lots of uh, check and signs of elephants. Alan from New Zealand, you're asking what animal do I find interesting to study and observe? I'd say it's uh, again the wild dogs. Um, you know, unfortunately, wild dogs, they, they pick up diseases fairly easily and they, they do tend to, to die off quite quickly. So, one thing that I do enjoy doing is finding out reasons why does this occur and how does this occur. Um, you know, in trying to make a difference to save a species that is currently endangered. Um, you know, and I think it's a, it's a common interest that all of us share here is that we all want to do as much as we can for the wildlife. But I would say by far that the wild dog takes my interest as my favorite animal, as well as, you know, the animal that I enjoy researching and, and looking up on. Um, you know, in the previous places where I've worked, unfortunately, some of the dogs have have moved on um, due to one specific disease called distemper 
um, and this is something that affects the dogs in quite a negative way and it affects their immune systems they pick up other diseases quicker uh, and it lowers that um, white blood cell count fairly quickly um, so you know looking at all of these different aspects of the bush and all of the different reasons as to why this happens it's, it's something that takes a, a massive interest of mine to see how can we make a difference what can we do to help Edmund, you are asking, what is the average size of a pack of hunting dogs? Well, hunting dogs, you know, they, they vary in size. Yesterday, James got very fortunate and he saw three together. So, it varies and a lot of it depends on the dominant male and female. So, when you're looking at the makeup of a pack of dogs, of wild dogs, also another name that you might be more familiar with is a painted dogs. Um, now, the, the whole pack, it is run by what you call the dominant pair. Now, the dominant pairs are the ones that have the mating rights and that will do the, the raising and, you know, they will have, you know, a certain number of pups and from that, other adults can also look after them. Um, and it also largely depends on other predators in the area, areas where you find multiple lions and multiple leopards the dogs don't do very well because at the end of the day it is competition for food where there's competition you eliminate your competition and you can then have more food sources available to yourself so it largely depends on predators in the area and um, and the dominant pair okay but here we are at Fuyatela Dam up ahead looks like we've got some bushbuck and some impala coming down for a drink but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a little bit further down so we can get a better angle shot of them and you can really get some finer details of them back home just going to approach nice and slowly here we don't want to scare anything off and if you look at this big tree on the right hand side look below it you can see there's a bit of movement that movement there it's some sneaky little monkeys. That is the vervet monkey. <laughs> Just trying to get warm for the morning before they go off and forage for the day. And it's actually quite cute when you see them when they wake up and they sit in the tree and they just kind of sit there and they do, do one of those you know and then they'll come back up and they give a little jolt and it's like having a shot of espresso in the morning for them okay there goes there goes the impalas So, a bit of a correction there, that's not a, a bush buck, but it actually looks like a young male Nyala. Now, we saw the young Nyala this morning when, when Jamie had the two, two individuals. Let's see if he's going to come out in the open here. No, he's not playing ball today. Sorry folks, we're not going to go all the way backwards, I promise you. This isn't a, a backwards safari. But right now what we're doing is we're just uh, reversing on the road. No, we don't. We want to cause as little damage as possible to the environment. Okay. Aqua, you're asking what are my hobbies and interests? Um, one of my big hobbies is wildlife photography um you know that's something that i have a, a very big interest in um and something else fairly unique uh mountain boarding 
where mountain boarding, best way to explain it would be a, I don't know actually, a, probably a, an oversized, oversized skateboard with some oversized wheels for off-roading and you go down the mountains on it and I tell you, it tends to be fairly painful when you do fall but when you don't fall it's hell of a fun. So, but I'd say photography definitely takes, takes that one. Um, yeah, I'm a very keen photographer. Beautiful down on the left here, we've got some stunning Impala. Okay, so you're asking, can I play any instruments? Other than the triangle, no. I, I can't play many. Um, it's something that I, I've never learned how to do. I've never learned how to, um, learned how to read music. And I just found, you know, when I was in, in junior school, I actually tended to excel at playing the triangle. So you see, well, while we're looking at these Impala, a lot of what they're feeding on at the moment, it's, it's herbaceous. Um, you know, Impala, they, they become so successful out here. They, they're what you, we refer to as a mixed feeder. And they can feed on both the grasses as well as the, the vegetation around them. You know, grasses, trees and leaves. So, due to this, they are able to, to survive you know, really nicely out here. And another reason why we see so many around is a lot of the Impala... Um, you know, by dropping their young all at the same time around November when the first rains come, you know, predators can only eat so much. So, you know, a lot of their, their survival rate is, is increased dramatically. Oh, look at that. The other one to follow. Beautiful. And down they go. Oh, they just want to have a little break in the shade. But let's carry on. Just had a, a brief visual of our, of our Nyala. Our young and yala bull, he, he went somewhere down here on the right. Oh, beautiful actually. Look at this. Let's stop here. Okay. Look directly behind that tree in the shade. Now, something that fits in so, so nicely. I know you know what it is at home. It's a kudu. A greater kudu. Um, Jamie saw some this morning when she was uh, up front. And now we see it again. But what you're going to find on this kudu is it nice for it to stay in thicker, denser areas like you can see what it's doing right now. And when it feels threatened, because it is already in thick bush, it'll stand dead still against a tree or a bush. And if you look closely at the white stripes that it has on the side of the body, those white stripes are what we refer to as disruptive coloration. And that disruptive coloration, it's there to break the outline of the body. So it becomes very difficult for a predator to actually identify an individual and to hunt one specific individual. And then what they'll do is they stand still, still, still. Predator gets closer and closer and closer, keeping very quiet. And then the kudu jumps. And as the kudu jumps, it does a startle display. By jumping like that, the predator gets a fright to thinks, oh no, what has just happened? And from there, it gives this kudu a second or two more to run away, which is all it may need. But beautiful to, you can't actually see the whole body, but beautiful to see that camouflage working there. Something, something very special. And again, going back to the smaller aspects that help the animals. You can see the bush bug, just some movement, just walking through the bush. And it also shows, you know, kudu and a, a bush buck, they're part of the same family of, of antelope. They're both part of what we call the spiral horned antelope family, the Chikalakas family. And they both use a similar defense to get away from predators. That's why when we saw that in Yala, that's why it also has the stripes coming down the body. And it has those spots around to break the outline and use that disruptive coloration. But at the moment, we're going to carry on, see if there's anything being drawn to the watering hole at the moment. Maybe we can get lucky with a herd of elephant or some buffalo. Let's see what we can get. 
But I say one thing that that has improved this morning is I've been able to start the vehicle first time now and find the uh, immobilizer. So you know what they say, you learn something every day. Down we go. There's something when I drive through the bush that uh, that I always look at. And I, it always gives me almost an airy feeling. There's all of these dead trees around, and I always think that it looks like a like a Halloween scene, you know, when you look around and there's this tree hanging this way and that one and hanging that way and then when there is a kill and then on the kill you get a lot of vultures and then you get the vultures sitting in the tree with that hunched back that long neck and they're just looking looking all around for me, that is one of my more I'd say more airy scenes of the bush um, and it's something pretty awesome actually to see and on the left here, we can see where an old buffalo was was killed, uh, most likely by a pride of lions. I don't know, maybe you guys at home, maybe you saw what happened here. Um, I wasn't here at the time, but maybe you can, can help me. Um, but right now, while we continue, we're going to go back across to Steph uh, and see what he's up to, see what he's got that side. You come back to us making our way through this Strychnos thicket and um, we're right on top of a crest at the moment. The sun is starting to beat down but we've got some male lion tracks. I don't have any male lion tracks here where I am now. I've been looking for them. We've been crisscrossing through these game paths looking for where he, the last track was found. But it looked like there was a male lion that came walking through here last night somewhere. A male lion are funny things to track. They walk in sort of perpendicular lines, transects to one another, they don't go from one point to another much the same as a leopard would. They sort of walk these zigzags and we lost these tracks a little bit further back and now I'm trying to find where he's zigzagged to. But in the meantime and because watching me track is A, not going to be very entertaining, I'm not a very good tracker, it's more luck than anything else and B, because we may never find this male lion's tracks, I thought we'd come and do a favorite pastime of mine and that is to find out ah, there we go yeah got him there's a centipede eater so a non-venomous snake have a look at that cape centipede eater that black head is just diagnostic i love finding things like this you know much better than watching me track boring boring lions so the, this particular snake is doing exactly what it needs to do and is looking for centipedes. You've noticed over the last couple of days and weeks, quite often when we lift up a, a branch we find a centipede. Well now we found what eats centipedes. And while that would be deadly for a centipede, we've got another absolutely deadly thing here. But I will, we will come back to her in a bit. I first want to watch this little snake hunting through obviously every nook and cranny. They're not dangerous for us. Now, catching centipedes is a hazardous, is a hazardous occupation. Centipedes are, are quite venomous. They have a very virulent cytotoxin and sharp poison claws. And for the life of me, I can't actually remember how this particular snake overcomes centipedes. I don't know if it's got a poison or venom, excuse me, that is keyed to centipedes or if it constricts centipedes. I'd love to know while we're busy watching this, please if you can, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or using the Twitter handle hashtag Safari Live. I know it's not too much time left of Safari, but I'd love to know how this particular centipede eater disposes of centipedes, whether they have venom or whether they are constrictors. In other words, they bite, hold on, and then constrict their prey. totally absolutely oblivious to us giving us this most wonderful view of this 
centipede eater busy looking. We've obviously made it much easier for him by, or her, I don't know what it is. They're very difficult to sex. In actual fact, the only way to sex a snake is by probing their cloaca with a shallow depression or a shallow cloaca or common urogenital opening being shallower in the male than it is in the female. It's the only way to reliably sex snakes. Obviously, if they've got some diagnostic features, worm slangs for instance, males are green and females are brown. But in this particular instance, there is no sexual dimorphism. In other words, there's no clear difference between a male or a female. I have a look at that very spade-like head. You'll actually see, while this is coming towards you, you'll see the head has got a very sharp spade on it and that is because it uses it to push open openings in the sand to look for centipedes. I'm convinced it's probably not the only thing that it eats. You probably find that this little guy or girl would eat any number of, of different invertebrates but centipedes are where it gets its name. The Cape Centipede Eater and I knew it instantly because of that black head and brown body. Now snake, it's warm day. It's a warm day. Ah, it's going down a going down a hole. And that's I think around about the last we're gonna see of the snake. If he's going down a hole to go and hunt for centipedes. That's that for us for now. Ah, there he pulls out. Now I'm gonna say goodbye because it's come to the end of our walk. And I have to say thank you on behalf of VM and myself. Thank you for the interest you've shown today. Answering your questions was lovely. Thanks for your patience as always. And for the last couple of minutes of this particular drive, we're gonna go back to VM. Uh, excuse me, back to Joffers. <laughs> back to Joffers. See you again. Okay, uh, so now we, we're coming to the end of our drive. I must say especially thank you to you as the viewers. It has been fantastic doing this journey with you. It has been a, a really great adventure. I must say I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you know, it's, it's something very special. And a big thank you to, to Jamie and Brian for, for helping me on the back here. I must say I really appreciate your guys' help. Uh, and thank you to, to the girls back at, uh, at HC. There, there's his thumb. Um, good old Mr. Thumb. And to the girls at FC, thank you very much for all your help this morning. It really has been fantastic. We've had some phenomenal sightings of the buffaloes, that great sighting of the Ellie. Um, and I just from my side, I want to say thank you very much for, for taking this journey with me. All right. And we will be, you won't be seeing us, or you'll be seeing us this afternoon. We won't be seeing you. See you for the afternoon game drive. Have a fantastic day.